MZTV. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. This is Martin Sender, never shying away from the difficult topics in Scripture. There are some hard sayings, even in Paul. This passage in 1 Corinthians 6 concerning those who will not be enjoying an allotment in the kingdom of God. This is a difficult passage. And I myself, for years, just kind of uh, brushed over it, didn't spend too much time on it. But uh, I am glad that this topic has come up. I don't remember how it came up. It doesn't matter, but we're all being edified by this. I loved your comments. Thank you so much. Many of you have told me that you're glad that, I, that I'm doing a deep dive into this, and it's clearing up some difficulties several of you have had with this passage and with the whole discrepancy between being reckoned as just, being reckoned as righteous, but not yet being constituted as righteous. This is a weird situation we find ourselves in, really, because we know the truth. We reckon ourselves a certain way, and yet we see our bodies still straining, or we see the old man still flailing around. But that's to be expected, and Paul wants us to walk worthily of the calling, but he's not going to force anybody to do it. He can't force anybody to do it. Somebody made a great comment today. It's like, look, if if someone is really missing the mark, and if somebody wants to have that allotment, it's going to have to be God operating in them to will and to work for the sake of his delight. No question about it. It has to be God. And no one should be losing their peace over this. But this information actually saved a woman's life. Like I told you yesterday, I ended the show with that. The woman who told me she was going to commit suicide on Wednesday. And I, I gave her the truth. That if we are enduring, we shall be reigning together also. I told her committing suicide while not bringing you under the condemnation of God or Christ. You will miss out on reigning because killing yourself is not exactly enduring. And that truth saved her life. The truth will do that. If I had said, well, you know, it really doesn't matter what you do because God is all in all. God's going to be all in all and he's sovereign and you can only do what God w wants you to do. You already know what, how that would go over. That's a weak answer. It's not a scriptural answer. It's, again, importing the absolute into a very, very relative situation. And we can't be afraid of the truth. We have to be very careful when we're talking about behavior. We're not forcing anybody to behave. This is so different from the law of Moses. The law of Moses says, do this or die. People were stoned for adultery. People were stoned for murder. No one in the body of Christ, by members of the body of Christ, is killed for, for murder. The, the, the state might do it, but nobody in the body of Christ is going to do it. And God in Christ themselves are certainly not going to do it. And again, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, sober up justly and do not be sinning. You know, people take offense at that, and I, my response is always, well, what do you want Paul to say? Everybody sin? That would be the opposite of saying that. Well, why does Paul have to talk about sin at all? Because we're still dealing with it. We're not wrestling with it anymore spiritually. We're not feeling spiritual guilt over it. And we know that where sin increases, the grace of God superabounds. All these things, when you apprehend them, will work on you to cause you to behave correctly. And so grace has much more power to bring people, to bring the flesh in line than law. Law said, do this or else. Grace says no matter what you do, you cannot fall into the disfavor of God. 
And just because someone is not ruling or reigning with Christ or has a special allotment within the body of Christ does not mean they have come under the disfavor of God, not at all. Because, because God is not only conciliated to us, he's conciliated to the entire world. But as much as we are able, we're to be exemplaries. Rob Weil brought up 1 Corinthians, uh, no, Rob Weil brought up th uh, Romans 13, 1. And th this is a good verse in so many ways. It says, let every soul be subject to the superior authorities. In other words, no civil disobedience out there. And then Paul goes on to say, because not in vain is the civil authority wearing the sword. So this falls under the you reap what you sow category. Members of the body of Christ can go afoul of the law. Members of the body of Christ can indeed sin. In Romans 13, 1, that whole passage there proves it. Because Paul is warning them, don't sin. Because the immediate consequence will be the superior authorities will cut your head off. Unless you're Paul, who's head was cut off gratuitously. Paul never committed a crime. Neither did our Lord. And do you think our apostle was perfect? No. Do you remember that big fight he had with Barnabas about whether to take Barnabas's nephew, John Mark, on the missionary journey, the second one? Paul said, he's not going. He bailed out on us during the first missionary journey. I'm not taking that guy. Barnabas says, well, if John Mark's not going, I'm not going. Paul says, well, see you then. And boom, they recoiled from one another. Impatience? I believe Paul was impatient. I believe he had an anger streak in him. And this man's thorn in the flesh was not some physical infirmity. It was some moral flaw. It was sin. And if you were to ask me what it is, I, I would say it was either impatience or anger. Many times he channeled that anger into righteous indignation, but the guy had a short fuse. This was left over from his Pharisee days. So as Paul is telling these things to us, members of the body of Christ, he's telling it to himself. I'm convinced of that. So I said I was going to get into specific comments today, and that I am. Now, this first comment will show you just how repulsive it is to some members of the body of Christ that, that we could miss out on anything. It just doesn't seem right in a gospel of transcendent grace that we could miss out on anything. And so this, what is now to me and should be to all of you in 1 Corinthians 6, this plain scripture is so m misconstrued and twisted and tortured so as to make it say something that well, we might want it to say, but that it doesn't say. Here's the comment. I'm not going to name the name of the person. It would serve no purpose. This might be your view as well. So that's why I'm sharing it. My view is Paul is simply saying that when we enter and see the kingdom, when we enter and see the kingdom of God, none of us will be any of those things. All will have the allotment because all will be a new creation. Let me again read uh, the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I won't read the whole thing. Are you not aware that the unjust shall not be enjoying the allotment of God's kingdom? Be not deceived. Neither paramours, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, catamites, sodomites, thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards. I'm going to get into that greedy. Because another man said, oh, so just because I buy stuff and don't give everything to the poor, I'm going to miss out on an allotment. You know, I, I thought this was a, an amusing and interesting and insightful and actually an endearing question. It shows somebody who's struggling, and yet I'm going to show this struggler and anybody else who's having problems with their flaws and faults. Is it? This greedy is so much more than simply buying things and maybe even some things that you don't need. And 
uh, not giving to the poor. This is not what that is at all. But I, I say that that comment is endearing because this person is being far too hard on himself than he needs to be. I'm going to show you a passage from Ephesians that has the word greedy in it, and you're going to see the extent to which somebody has to be greedy in order to miss out on an allotment. Be not deceived, Paul says, neither paramours nor idolaters. And there's the whole list. Shall be enjoying the allotment of God's kingdom. <clears throat> and again, this gentleman said, my view, and I'm glad he said my view. I'm glad, and he, he ended this with, this is just my opinion. Paul is simply stating that when we enter and see the kingdom of God, none of us will be any of those things. But that would be a celebratory remark, wouldn't it? Paul would be saying, I have great news for you. What is it, Paul? Well, when we're finally in the kingdom of God, none of us are going to be drunkards. None of us are going to be adulterers. None of us are going to be catamites. Everybody would go, woo-hoo, that's awesome. But does this sound to you like a celebratory statement? Would Paul begin a celebratory statement like that? And by the way, wouldn't that be kind of like obvious? Wouldn't it go without saying that when we're snatched away, made immortal, that None of us will be needing a drink. None of us will be mm, jonesing to commit adultery. This, this is, wouldn't be a big, if this is what Paul is saying, which, which it's not, it wouldn't be a big revelation, would it? And I don't think Paul would begin a celebratory remark like that by saying, be not deceived. Be not deceived. Oh, good thing you said that, Paul, because I was starting to think that after I was snatched away, I was still going to be an adulterer. I could have been deceived on that, Paul, but thanks for telling me that when I get to heaven, I'm not going to be an adulterer anymore. No, it's not what Paul is saying at all. And in fact, let me give you some verses. There's three places in Paul's writings where he starts it with, be not deceived. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not to be sneered at. For whatsoever a man may be sowing, this shall he be reaping also. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. I read this verse yesterday. Be not deceived. Evil conversations are corrupting kind characters. Sober up justly and do not be sinning. And now our passage in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Be not deceived, neither paramours nor uh, adulterers. This, this is not saying that, well, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be any of those things. And it is certainly not saying that everybody's going to have the allotment, as this gentleman would want to think, would like to think, would hope to think, but it's not what Paul is saying. All will have the allotment because all will be a new creation. No, all will be in the body of Christ because all will be a new creation. But again, this is not about membership in the body of Christ. This is about a special allotment. And the context is clear that this is not a celebratory statement that nobody's going to be a sodomite anymore after they're snatched away. This is a warning that those who are sodomites or catamites or adulterers or idolaters or drunkards will be enjoying the allotment in the kingdom of God. So, again, that, that's a stretched, tortured view from somebody. And again, I understand the desire to Make this warning go away because it doesn't seem to fit the gospel of transcendent grace. But there it is. We have to take it seriously. And when we present this truth, it can save, it can save people's lives. Because I think if, if this person who made this comment were the one talking to my friend, well, don't worry, you won't be committing suicide once you're in the kingdom of God. I'm referencing now 2 Timothy 2.12, where Paul says, if we are enduring, we shall be reigning also. I suppose that the person who made this comment would cringe at that also and say, well, what Paul is saying is that once we're all reigning with Christ, we'll all be enduring. See, that's not what Paul is saying at all. He's saying not enduring will cost you. And as much as we might not like that, that truth can save lives. Literally, it saved a life. 
And it probably caused many of the Corinthians to shape up, which is good. That's what it's supposed to do. And here's another big objection I noticed that was a common thread with two or three people is that they couldn't believe that a passage like that could be applying to the body of Christ. But let me tell you a thing or two about the Corinthians. Because today, right here on MCTV, I'm going to go through the entire context. I'm going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And you're going to learn a little about the, the Corinthians. But I'm going to build up to that by reading a comment of another commenter. And again, thank you for the comments. And oh, I did want to say this. Is that I love it. I said that yesterday. I love all your comments. And there are many new people coming into the body of Christ and they're checking out this channel and they're asking legitimate questions. And I want you to be of the disposition that there's no such thing as a stupid question. And I would exhort everyone, please be as gracious as you can, even with those who are antagonistic, even those who come into the comment section flailing their fists. Show grace. And I'm telling this to myself as I'm telling it to you. Because I tend to, boom, fire off a response. And then a minute later, oops, I go back and I edit it. And I want that was a little, a little harsh. So show grace. Because you showing grace could be the difference between somebody continuing on and watching more shows, understanding more about God and Christ. The, the difference between that and just taking off like, oh, these people are... Just like the church people, condemning. No, we're not like that. We are not like that. Show grace to others as God has shown grace to you. So here's the comment. I've seen multiple people in the body of Christ discuss this topic, and I seem to be the only person who disagrees with seemingly everybody's take on this subject. Not what is said, but everyone else's interpretation of it. I genuinely think you are misconstruing, speaking to me, I genuinely think that you, Martin Zender, are misconstruing what Paul is saying here. But who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. I like that right there. And you see, like I said yesterday, whenever I get criticism on anything, I think maybe I'm wrong. And I have to check up on myself. Some things I know I'm not wrong. Other things that are a little bit gray, I'm thinking, well, I better, I better make sure about this. And then when I go into the scriptures to make sure about it, generally I'm confirmed in what I've always believed on it. And not only am I confirmed in it, but I see more insight into it. We have been made justified. How can we be unjust yet justified? And here was the big question I answered yesterday. How can we be unjust yet justified? And the key verse there was 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Let everyone who is naming the name of the Lord withdraw from injustice. So it is very possible for someone who is justified to be unjust. And the only way that would make sense to you is if you realize that we are reckoned righteous by God. We are not yet constituted righteous by God. And I have a verse for you on that, of course. It is Romans 3, 28. We are reckoning a man to be justified by faith apart from works of law. We are reckoning a man. That We are thinking of a man that way. We're not pretending that a man or a woman is that way because we're not constituted righteous yet. But God is so gracious to us that even while we're sinning down here, he sees us as a new creation. You remember Romans 6, we've been crucified with Christ. And we are justified in the sight of God. And what remains is for this body of sin to be nullified. The body of sin needs to be nullified. It's not yet nullified. You know, that's such an important verse. I want to go to it. For those who have not heard that before, let me go to Romans chapter 6, doing a live Bible study here. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, this is what the passage that talks about the new creation. Let's start with verse 5 of Romans 6. For if we have become planted together in the likeness of his death, and by the way, that goes along with 2 Timothy 
chapter 2, verse 12, that if we die with Christ, we should be living together with him also. And yesterday I cross-referenced that with Romans 6, and here it is. For if we have become planted together in the likeness of his death, nevertheless, we shall be of the resurrection also, period. End of sentence. Nothing to do with your works. Nothing to do with an allotment in the kingdom. But this is general salvation. This is membership in the body of Christ. Knowing this, verse 6, that our old humanity was crucified together with him, that the body of sin may be nullified for us by no means to be still slaving for sin. For one who dies has been justified from sin. This slaving for sin has nothing to do with wrestling with sin. It's no longer slaving under the possibility of condemnation for your sin. No longer slaving, trying to claw your way to God because you think he's still condemning you for your sin. And as I've said many times, a slave of sin is just as much someone who is sinning like crazy as someone who is trying like crazy not to sin. The Christian who is trying like crazy not to sin is just as much a slave of sin as the person who's sinning like crazy because they're all involved with sin. We're not. We're looking ahead to Christ. But in the meantime, we still exhort one another and we still see each other doing things and we want to be reminded that eh, there's an allotment at stake here. There's ruling and reigning at stake here. And Paul even says, though, in, in Philippians that some are not disposed to that. Some don't care if they're going to rule and reign. I've talked to many people who just don't care. They just want to get in. Okay, that's fine. Paul says that we're to be mutually disposed to one another. That is, those of us who do want that. Those of us who are working in the arena of announcing the evangel or other aspects, we're to be kind and patient to those who, ah, pff, I'm in the body of Christ, I don't care. Don't condemn those people, that's fine. Maybe they're serial sodomites. I don't know. We wouldn't want that. We don't want to see that in the body of Christ, but it has nothing to do with salvation. So there, there we go. Our old humanity was crucified that the body of sin may be nullified. That's the future thing. Look at the, look at the tense here, the two different tenses, knowing this, that our old humanity was crucified together with them. That's being reckoned as righteous that the body of sin this frame this mortal frame may be nullified that's not going to happen until the resurrection that's not going to happen until god imparts immortality then you won't be able to sin because we sin because we are dying we are mortal and when god imparts immortality sin will be impossible so again going back to first corinthians 6 there's no way paul is saying that when we're made immortal, we're not going to sin anymore. No more adulterers. That's goes, it goes without saying. So it's not some after the fact thing. Whoa, look, what's, look how great we're going to be when we're snatched away. Look how great we're going to be when we're made immortal. That's a given. It's be careful how you're walking because there's an allotment at stake. So let's go back to the comment. We have been justified. How can we be unjust yet justified? I explain that. We are declared innocent. Well, God looks at us that way. We are reckoned to be that way. And then this commenter quotes the scripture, and some of you were these, speaking of the Corinthians, but you are bathed off, you are hallowed, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. Bathed off, hallowed, justified. I mean, he says it right there. This is the commenter. He says it right there. You are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He's talking about the unjust not receiving an allotment. I don't know why everybody thinks this is referring to the body of Christ. Why does he say that? Because Paul's talking about the unjust 
not receiving an allotment. But wait a minute, wouldn't that assume that none of the Corinthians were unjust? This gentleman thinks that Paul can only be talking about worldly people. He's talking about the unjust not receiving an allotment. I don't know why everybody thinks this is referring to the body of Christ. I will tell you exactly why this is referring to the body of Christ. Again, quoting the commenter, I mean, what even constitutes being greedy? Oh, I got so much. I, I got a great thing to tell you on this. Do I lose out? On, this is a great comment. Listen to this. Do I lose out on an allotment because I'm spending my money on dumb shit that I don't need instead of sharing it with those who do need it? I don't see how that makes any logical sense. How are we justified but unjust? Again, I explain that so everybody understands it now. Or are you not aware that the unjust shall not be enjoying the allotment of God's kingdom? How is this not talking about those who aren't in the body of Christ? I will tell you. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 9, is talking to the Corinthians. Do you want to know how Paul starts this letter? Paul, a called apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God, and Sosthenes, a brother, to the ecclesia of God, which is in Corinth. He's writing this to the body of Christ, hallowed in Christ Jesus, called saints. Called saints. Saint is someone separated to God. The term saint, hagion, has nothing to do with anyone's moral behavior. It has to do with being separated, set apart. That's what hagion means, someone who is set apart for God's use hallowed in christ jesus called saints that word hallowed and the word saints is the same greek word and i wish the concordant version had been consistent either putting sainted in christ jesus called saints or hallowed in christ jesus called hallowed it's the same greek word hagion so the corinthians were separated unto god they were part of the ecclesia of god and they were invoking the name of the Lord. I didn't read that part. Listen to this, the end of verse 2. Hallowed in Christ Jesus, called saints, together with all in every place who are invoking the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, now he's going to kick their ass throughout this letter. This is the most worldly ecclesia that Paul had to deal with. But listen to what he says here. Those who are invoking the name of the Lord. Is this not consistent or what? 2 Timothy 2, 19. Let everyone who is naming the name of the Lord withdraw from injustice. There you go. Justified people are unjust. Holy people are unjust, unjust sinners doing some really bad stuff. And yet I emphasize verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This message that I'm bringing to you, that Paul brought to the Corinthians, that still applies to us today. We're dealing, this is so great. We are so united with our brethren in Corinth. They're dealing with the same problems we're dealing with. They're dealing with the same issues. These people probably read Romans, and they're seeing Paul warning them about it. Yes, warning them about their behavior now i want to go to the direct context context because this brother says there's no way paul could be talking to members of the body of christ he's talking about unjust people but wait a minute what is that it also assumes that no unjust person could be in the body of christ but the body of christ consists of unjust people a am i am i reading that right same with the first commenter Everybody has an allotment. They must, must be talking about general salvation because the unjust, there's nobody unjust in the body of Christ. There's no idolaters, adulterers, sodomites, catamites. Yes, there are, especially in Corinth. This is definitely talking to the body of Christ. We have no idea what Paul's dealing with here. Actually, we have no excuse for not having an idea. If you read 1 Corinthians, you get more than an idea. And if you don't have an idea, I'm going to give you a big one right now. Let's go to the general context. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Dare any of you having business with another? This is the same chapter where we come up on verse 9. Are you not aware that the unjust 
Oh, we can't be unjust and justified at the same time. Oh, yes, we can. And we are. And this is a warning. Be not deceived. This is a warning. It's not a celebratory statement like, ah, okay, already talked about that. Dare any of you having business with another be judged before the unjust and not before the saints? This is interesting because there are unjust in the world and unjust among the saints. And we're going to see that. That's a tricky statement there because someone could read that and say, having business with one another be judged before the unjust and not before the saints. But there are unjust in the world and there are unjust in the body of Christ. There's a big difference between how God treats the unjust in the world and the unjust in the body of Christ. The unjust in the body of Christ are saved because it delights God to save the unjust. While we are still sinners, Christ died for our sakes. While we are still infirm, still in accord with the era, Christ died for us. So there's no doubt whatsoever that the saints are unjust, but the worldly people are also unjust, and Paul is calling them that here. And yet these people who are unjust in the world, they don't have Aeonian life. Why? Because God didn't choose them before the disruption of the world to come to a realization of how Christ dealt with their sins. They're going to get that revelation at the great white throne. Let's go on. Verse 2. Or are you not aware that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world is being judged by you, are you unworthy of the least tribunals? Are you not aware that we shall be judging messengers, that is, angels, celestial beings, not to mention life's affairs? Verse 4. If indeed, then, you should have tribunals for life's affairs, the contemptible in the ecclesia, these you are seating? It's, Paul, Paul's admitting that there are contemptible people in the ecclesia. He's hearing about people judging one another in the ecclesia. This is good judging, that is, adjudicating in cases of people being wronged. You're seating co the contemptible in the ecclesia? You're putting the contemptible in the ecclesia in charge? You should put the decent people in the ecclesia in charge. Paul is it admitting here that there are contemptible people in the Corinthian ecclesia. Yeah, hallowed in Christ Jesus called saints. Grace and peace. Yep, there are. Verse 5, to abash you am I saying this, to make you ashamed. Thus, is there not among you one wise man who will be able to adjudicate amidst his brethren? Paul's looking for one wise person in this freaking ecclesia. Paul's exasperated many times in this letter, but you can't ever forget how he started this letter. There's not among you one wise man who will be able to adjudicate amidst his brethren, but brother was suing brother, and this before unbelievers. See, it confirms what I told you, that there are unjust unbelievers and unjust believers. But what a difference between how they're treated based on being called and being justified. The unbelievers in this world who are unjust, they still have that secret guilt, that secret striving deep inside of them, and that won't be dealt with till the great white throne. With us, spiritually, how God sees us, it's dealt with now. Already, indeed, then, it is absolutely a discomfiture for you that you are having lawsuits among yourselves. Wherefore, like, why are you even having lawsuits at all? Wherefore, are you not rather being injured? Wherefore, are you not rather being cheated? Cheated? Who's cheating them? Other members of the ecclesia. Because they're supposed to be adjudicating among themselves. Is there not one wise man who will be able to adjudicate amidst his brethren? So therefore, when Paul says, wherefore are you not rather being cheated? People are being cheated by other brothers in the body of Christ. Sometimes this is as good as it gets. And the reason this is in scripture is to show you that none of us are ever going to be perfect. Verse 9, or are you not aware that the unjust, now you see, oh, look at that. Now we're flowing into the context. Or are you not aware that the unjust shall not be enjoying the allotment of God's kingdom? Yes, he's talking to the unjust in the Corinthian ecclesia. Now Paul's getting down to it. 
He's starting small. He's saying, come on, judge among yourselves. Fix this among yourselves. Ah, Paul, yeah, well, maybe we'll get to it next week. And then Paul gets serious. Be not deceived. Be not deceived. You better get to it now. Why, Paul? Are you not aware that this kind of person and this kind of person and this kind of person and this kind of person will not be enjoying an allotment in God's kingdom? <gasps> that would have stopped them short. I promise you, that stopped them short. They may have been rolling their eyes as Paul was talking about appointing, is there not one wise person among you? Oh, yeah, well, didn't maybe. Wait a minute, I got something else to tell you. What, Paul? I don't want you to be deceived about something. What, Paul? None of these people doing these things will be enjoying an allotment in God's kingdom. Ooh. That would have got to him. And verse 11, and some of you are these, but you are bathed off, you are hallowed. You are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you were these, but some of them still were these. Some of you were these, but you are bathed off, you are hallowed, you were justified. I told you yesterday that it's the truth of justification. I said it today too. Great. It's the truth of justification, the truth of grace that will change a person. Grace has power. The law had no power. The law only had power to condemn. Grace has power to save. Isn't that ironic? That by realizing you're off the hook for your sins, as far as salvation goes, that that has power to curb your earthly appetites? Yeah. Then Paul says, all is allowed me, but not all is expedient. See? This is a warning. All is allowed me. Yes, we're all saved, but not all is expedient. And he just told them how inexpedient it was. All is allowed me, but I will not be put under its authority by anything. Foods for the bowels and the bowels for foods, yet God will be discarding these as well as those. Now the body is not for prostitution, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Why is Paul talking about prostitution now? Because <laughs> there were people in the Corinthian Ecclesia who were dabbling in cult prostitution. Corinth was rife with houses of cult prostitution. That's an historical fact. I mentioned that in my book, The Lie of Every Man's Battle. If you don't have that book, why not? You don't have it. It's available now, martinsender.com. Are you not aware that your bodies are members of Christ? Taking then the members of Christ away, should I be making them members of a prostitute? May it not be coming to that. See, Paul doesn't say, well, that, that's impossible. That could never happen. He says, may it not be coming to that. Like, it is very possible for someone who is a member of Christ to then take his body and making it a part of a prostitute in the body of Christ, mind you, hallowed, called saints. Paul says, why am I even mentioning this? I know it could never happen. Why am I even mentioning this? Because none of those earlier sins have to do with the body of Christ. They all have to do with worldly people. No, he says, may it not be coming to that because he know it could come to that. And in fact, in Corinth, right then, it was coming to that. Or are you not aware that he who joins a prostitute is one body? For he is averring, the two will be one flesh. Now he who joins the Lord is one spirit. Flee from prostitution. There, there's that crazy poll again warning people about their negative behavior. Doesn't this guy know they're saved by grace? I would think that above anyone on the planet, this man would know more about that than anyone. Are you not aware that he who joins with a prostitute is one body? Flee from prostitution. The penalty of sin, whatever a man should be doing, is outside the body, yet he who is committing prostitution is sitting against his own body. Or are you not aware that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have from God, and you are not your own? See, Paul's continually c contrasting what they are in Christ with what they're doing. 
Your, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Fact. You are members of Christ. Fact. You are hallowed, called saints. Fact. Grace and peace is operating among you. Fact. You are visiting prostitutes. Fact. You are cheating each other. Fact. There are more contemptible people in this ecclesia than worthy people. Fact. <laughs> Paul ends this chapter this way in verse 20. For you're bought with a price. By all means, glorify God in your body. Paul's not bringing law. Actually, he's being quite delicate here. He's not bringing law to them. He's not talking about stoning. This is an exhortation. By all means, like by all means, whatever method you have within this body of people here, glorify God in your body if, if you can work it out. You know, by whatever means you have, if you can work it out, just glorify God in your body. How about that? What do you think? What do you think, Corinthians? Hmm. That's Paul's attitude here. That's Paul's attitude. I'm looking at my time. I can't believe this. Oh, man, I'm getting into this topic. This is so good. I have to follow through. I told you I was going to talk about the greedy. This guy was worried about because I don't give shit to the poor. I buy shit I don't need. I don't give it to the poor. Am I going to miss an allotment? I'll finish with this verse, Ephesians 4, 17 through 90. I know there's many of you who see the show going this long, and you go, oh, yeah. You love it because you're hardcore. Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 19. And I'll end with this, I promise. This then I am saying and attesting in the Lord. By no means are you still to be walking according as those of the nations also are walking. See, this goes back to the beginning of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. Paul's still dealing with it in Ephesians. That some of the nations, some of those in the Ecclesia are walking the same as those of the nations. This is why in the body of Christ, you cannot judge a person by their fruit. You can't. That's a great point. In the kingdom gospel, the gospel of the the circumcision by your fruit you know them but in the body of christ you don't always know them by their fruit because we're not judged according to our fruit nobody should look at the fruit of anyone to determine whether they're in the body of christ or not what do you look at designated beforehand for the place of a son or a daughter designated beforehand the placement of god but in the kingdom evangel it's you produce fruit worthy of repentance or you're probably not in the circumcision evangel. You're probably not a part of that ecclesia, that ecclesia, the gospel of the circumcision. But we can't judge each other according to our fruit. We're to judge each other by our confession that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was entombed, and raised the third day. That's how you determine someone's in the body of Christ, not by looking at their fruit. Having said that, of course, we want to see good fruit, but we are growing in the growth of God, not in the growth of ourselves. That is not according to our pace, according to God's pace. By no means are you still to be walking according as those of the nations also are walking in the vanity of their mind, their comprehension being darkened, being estranged from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Ha <laughs> ha, look at that. Ignorance is deadly. Ignorance of the gospel of grace. That's why people are estranged from the life of God because they don't know about the gospel of the grace of God because of the callousness of their hearts. Verse 19, who being past feeling in greed, there's the word greed, the greedy, in greed, giving themselves up with wantonness to all uncleanness as a vocation. That's in the Bible. That's in the scriptures. Verse 19. Ephesians 4, as a vocation, like they're doing it like it's their job. That's what I told you. All these sins Paul is mentioning in 1 Corinthians 6. It's not like you slip up once and commit adultery. Don't want anybody to do that. It's not like you accidentally kill somebody. It's not like you get drunk once in a while. No, these are people who do these things as a vocation. 
It's being greedy as a vocation. In greed, but look at the extent of the greed, giving themselves up with wantonness to all uncleanness. This is greed for darkness. It's not greed for, ah, I bought a couple more things at Walmart and I'm not going to, I'm not going to contribute to the starving children in Africa at the, at the checkout. Would you like to contribute a dollar to this? No, not today. Thank you. Oh God, I'm not going to have an allotment now. That's not talking about that. It's not talking about that at all. It's about greed. That is this unending desire for dark things. Wantonness means to do in the dark. That's what the word wantonness means here. In greed, giving themselves up with wantonness. That is things that you do at night that you don't want anybody to, to know about. Secret things. As a vocation. Doing it like it's your freaking job. Now Paul dials it back in verse 20. Now you did not thus learn Christ. <laughs> I didn't tell you to do these things. This is not what I taught you. Since surely him you hear and by him were taught according as the truth is in Jesus. <laughs> so, yeah, put off from yourself, verse 22, as regards your former behavior, the old humanity, which is corrupted in accord with its seductive desires, yet be rejuvenated in the spirit of your mind. Did you ever hear anybody teaching the law of Moses in the circumcision? Just be rejuvenated in the spirit of your mind. How do we deal with our sin, Peter? Just be rejuvenated in the spirit of your mind. No, circumcision Repent and be baptized or else. Circumcision, produce fruit worthy of repentance or else. Circumcision, endure to the end or you won't be saved. What does Paul say? Yeah, be rejuvenated in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new humanity, which in accord with God is being created in righteousness and benignity of the truth. Ah, oh, beautiful. I want to go on here. I want to go on here, but look at my time. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I got I to gotta stop. I'm going to do another day on this because... I, I shouldn't stop. I should just keep going. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to finish this. It's too good. Wherefore, putting off the false, let each be speaking the truth with his associate. Listen how gracious this is. This is tied in with how Paul begins all his letters, grace and peace, speaking truth with his associate, for we are members of one another. We're a family, folks. I'm here every day with you. It's a highlight of my day. I love it. Are you indignant and not sinning? Do not let the sun be sinking on your vexation. What a beautiful way to say. Stop being so mad at people. Don't, don't let the sun sink on your vexation. It's like you can be vexed. I'll give you that. But by the end of the day, solve it. Yet not be giving place to the adversary. Let him who steals by no means still be stealing. Yet rather let him be toiling, working with his hands at what is good that he may have to share with one who has need. Let no one... Let no tainted word at all be issuing out of your mouth. But if any is good toward needful edification, that it may be giving grace to those hearing. And Paul is giving grace to those hearing. He's being quite easy on the Corinthians. This is in Ephesians. But as you can see, even in this late letter, in this high spiritual letter, still dealing with people who are walking the same way as people of the world. And yet they are members of the body of Christ. They are hallowed. They are called saints. And do not be causing sorrow to the Holy Spirit of God by which you are sealed for the day of deliverance. You're sealed. You can't get out of this. No matter what you do, you can't get out of this. Let all bitterness and fury and anger and clamor and calumny be taken away from you with all malice. Yet become kind to one another. This is my exhortation to you. And as I started to show my exhortation how to treat new people coming in, watching these videos to the first, for the first time, be kind. Tenderly compassionate, dealing graciously among yourselves, according as God also in Christ deals graciously with you. And thus endeth Ephesians chapter 4.